Hi everyone and welcome back. I know it's been an awful long time since I've done a podcast recording for the Compassion Show, but life has been very, very busy, but I am so excited to welcome Benita Temert to the podcast. And we've been talking for three or four weeks and I said, right, we've got to get on the podcast. But this podcast can be slightly different because we're going to go on and on and on. So we're going to not we're not going out live today because just in case we have to create many episodes from this, we've had some fantastic conversation. So Vanita, welcome. I'm very blessed that you can spend the time with, with us today. And I guess I just want to start out by asking you a question, really, because obviously you and I come from the same kind of high technology world. And we both come from a sales kind of environment. We've both been in the sales function. But just as a way of introduction, how come you've got to where you are today and doing what you're doing? So, well, first of all, Nigel, thank you so much for having me. And we have indeed had some absolutely sensational conversations um, around, around this topic. So I'm a psychologist, consultant and hypnotherapist, and I've been working with mental health and employee well-being for over 30 years. And during that time, um, as you're aware, I have worked extensively with leadership and sales enablement and really at a global level. I was in about working in about 75 plus countries. And so I have seen it all when it comes to behavior and what works, what doesn't, what's productive. And I am deeply, deeply concerned about the current state of affairs in terms of mental health, like globally. And employees, we're seeing a checking out across the globe. There's a real issue that's going on. And what I'm seeing consistently is it's just, it's stemming from really toxic and abusive behaviors in the workplace and in the past i think with our generation if i may it it's something that we turned a blind eye to we kind of shut down as individuals but today the younger generation coming in they're not having it so they'll if they see these type of behaviors they're walking out so i am now in a place where i'm really deeply focused on raising awareness of the issue working with individuals who have been the recipient of this kind of abuse in the workplace and helping them heal and getting them to a place where they're able to thrive. But I think it's not enough for me to just work with, with those um, individuals. We need to raise awareness mm. because it's destroying the workplace and it can't continue. Something has to change. Uh, and I think you, you and I are on the same path. So, I mean, I love, you know, looking at LinkedIn profile today, it's a trauma unwinder which I, I, thought, I thought was absolutely fascinating because because I needed it. I, I kind of I could have used your services ages ago and I was kind of leading sales teams. Mm. But I think because I, be, I became, I think we'll get into it a bit later, but I kind of I fell into that trap of, of being this kind of sales leader that I thought other people wanted me to be because I thought that was my route to success. Mm-hmm. But it was, but my God, that I failed drastically with it, 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 my, my emotional state with it. But I think... What you and I were just talking about this recently about some of the stats that were coming out that you know in the US I think there's about six hundred thousand sales jobs that are not being fulfilled and I think eighty thousand probably in the UK which is you know it's a red flag for the you know it's a red flag for the technology industry no question but it's a red flag for all industries where this could be the indicator that the sales function is broken. And it's not, I don't think personally that it's an, it's an indicator saying, hey, the buying process is different to the way the sales processes are today. I think it's a lot deeper than that. I think that's true at a high level, but that's the effect of what's going on. Mm-hmm. So have you kind of, you know, what, what kind of experiences have you seen that's creating people? You talk to a lot of people around the world all the time and you've had an incredible career. So you've got a deep insight into this about why people are not wanting to come into this what could be a fabulous career? What 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 have you seen? So working in this space, actually, like if let's go talk specifically about sales. It's actually a really um, if you're someone who's creative and social and you like problem solving, it's a beautiful area to work. And mm-hmm. you're working with your customers and you're solving their problems. You're you're able to creatively solve 
provide the solution of whatever your company is offering to the client in a way that will enhance um, their their own work environment. And if you're someone who um, is high in empathy and in emotional intelligence, then you're especially appealing to the customer because they feel understood, they feel seen, they feel heard. Now, where it goes wrong is these incredible individuals with these characteristics, probably a degree of empathy and, and um, care and high emotional intelligence, they go into an environment, old school culture that's sort of been sustained over many decades. And in those environments, here's where it gets tricky, the leadership roles, not just in sales, but across the company, but especially in sales, it's very, that kind of role is very attractive to people, to narcissists. Oh, and yeah. They are, they want that kind of role. Now, the thing is, they want the role, they don't even realize it. So, before I start going into all the, all the different tangents, I get very passionate about this. They, toxic individuals, are quite attracted to that role in terms of how it's going to make them look, the status, the, um, how, you know, they start to, they get in there, they create these fantasy realities, they inflate numbers, the, the ego just completely takes over and they're absolutely reveling in it. Now, what happens to these employees who came in who are compassionate, high emotional intelligence, they enjoy problem solving creatively with their customer, they're suddenly thrown into an environment of fear. Um, it's kind of like working under these really toxic monsters they're in this environment where they're shut down. They when you when you're scared, when you're feeling bullied, controlled, someone's standing there with this ridiculous um, target for you, and you know in reality X, Y, Z has happened. You can't you can't meet that target. You're too afraid to speak up. So you start to shut down. What happens when you start to shut down? creativity starts to shut down what happens you start to feel diminished as an individual and suddenly you're not enjoying your work you're kind of scared you need to come up with these numbers you might even start lying yourself in order to survive the environment and not be cut you're in such poor energy at this point then you're going out to the customers disseminating that on the customers so this is whole toxic chain which Individuals going into those roles probably went into with really beautiful intentions. Yeah. Uh, you just got, as you always do, you, you notice I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm looking up because you always get me to <laughs> ponder and reflect. And I think as you've been talking, I've been thinking, actually, did I make a massive mistake in my own personal career going into sales leadership? Because I actually felt I was a great salesperson when I was young. You know, why? Because I cared about people. And I wanted to serve the best that I could. And then I went into, as many organizations do, oh, he's a great salesperson, must make him a sales leader. Right. Now, I was personally, I, that wasn't, you know, I always felt I was a great manager of people. I always thought I could get the best out of people from in terms of motivation, performance, and a bit of pragmatism too. I, I'd, I'd hope the people who, who I used to work with would say that. But there's a real difference between me becoming, and actually I'm right, I'm doing a presentation on it soon, being an empathetic, unhealthy manager. And I went, then I became an autocratic, stressed out, maniac of a boss. And now I'm coming out as a loving, caring, compassionate leader. So I've gone from this thing about being an empathetic, unhealthy manager which we can talk about in a bit the, the dark side to empathy in, in business not in personal life but definitely in business which led me to becoming completely stressed out as an autocratic boss that did the thing that you were talking about which is leading with fear and we all know about the forecast school right that is the, the most salespersons dread that's the sales leaders dread getting it wrong because we all kind of lie in that line go Everyone believes the line. It goes up the chain. And that's where our numbers come from. Mm -hmm. But then uh, having a deep reflection and then coming up. But I have to think about now, you know, did, should, did I take the wrong path? Should I have actually, could I had? would have I had the courage enough just to make sure I was a great salesperson, a very successful one probably, but actually maintain my own trust and honesty that I'm going to continue to serve my customers in the best way. And I think this is where I think we all go a bit wrong 
because we, we have this kind of perception from a senior leadership position, we have to create a next generation of sales leaders. True, but how do we get the right one? Do we take the best salesperson and try and make them a, a manager and a leader? Would we allow our best salespeople just to be great salespeople the rest of their career and make them extremely happy? Because I've seen countless sales executives, account executives, global or whatever level they're working in, become, you know, as you quite rightly said, you know, small versions of themselves because we're kind of putting this kind of pressure on them. They're saying, right, you know, you've now been a great salesperson. Now you've got to change and change your whole life, the fear. And they take it home with them and all the family start to crush and all these emotions start to crush. It's just a crazy thing. So I mean, yeah. I'm not sure if you agree with that. Absolutely. And and actually, in a moment, I've got a couple of questions for you, if that's okay. Oh, okay. you have traversed <laughs> that path. So if you're open to it, I am. Um, I'm open. <laughs> we've got you right there. So you have been through that path. But for, the first thing I want to say is um, to your last comment, they are absolutely taking this home. If you're feeling diminished at work, bullied, scared, these are very low vibration contracted energies. And these individuals are then taking that home. And it's now not so joyful for their family because they have you, but they don't have the best version of you. They have this small, contracted, scared version. And on a Saturday evening, you're probably, and I have personally seen this over a 20 plus year period where people are already dreading Monday and they're dreading the forecast call and they're actually dreading going to the office. And this is on Saturday afternoon. So mm. Saturday night is ruined. Sunday with the family, they're working, working the numbers, like trying to prepare it. And um, so not only is that the family is now bearing the brunt of that for that individual over a prolonged period of time, Nigel, what's so mm. sad is that this stays in the individual's nerve, nervous system. What many people in, in the, the corporate environment are not aware that contracted energy, those feelings, the, the negative um, neurotransmitters that are just flowing through this individual, that stays in their body, it starts to affect their health. Now, they don't know it at first, but over a period of time in a prolonged um, toxic environment, it really starts to deplete their health. They won't see it at first, but it will start to impact their well-being. They'll get sick a lot, um, anxiety, depression, um, but also health impact. And there are some. there is a long tail of consequence that mm. results on this so it's a really really big deal and the let thing me share, is let me share a personal story for you with them before yeah, you ask me two you. questions but so when i was 21 22 i was working um i used to be in the hospitality business i used to have been in a restaurant train i loved it to bits so i was 21 22 years old and i was mentored by the founder of a company called peter express which we all in the uk we all know them and he was a founder and he I was working in edinburgh and when he was Two or three weeks later, I'm working in London, and I'm a 20-year-old person, <laughs> a bit shit scared to be honest, working from this lovely environment of Scotland coming down to the, to the west end of London. But anyway, I had some incredible experiences, and I was working extremely long hours, all that kind of stuff. But he brought me into this the flagship restaurant right in the west end of London, and we had 100, 120 staff working for me. We were doing about 15 to 17 million pounds worth of business. This is 1988 or something like that, you know, which is way back when. We had 700 seats in the restaurant. We, we were, we were, it was the UK's largest restaurant. Anyway, so I was working from, it was a great environment. We had a great culture. And, uh, you know, you imagine 120 diverse personalities and different personalities in that trade. It was, it, it was fantastic. And I learned an awful lot. And then I kind of went on to work for another big organization, more compliant. You know, but I thought, ah, now I'm going to go and make, you know, make my, fortune in america so i left I was about 22 23 i went to, to new york and i and i ended up working in a, in a restaurant just off wall street and oh my god was this toxic it was in horrible but i put up with it but i thought I, I carried this kind of work ethic working 17 18 hours a day in london took it to new york da 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 and then i was so it was such a toxic work environment i, f I felt the stress and anxiety at 26, you know, really felt it, but I didn't know what was going underneath my skin. But at the age of 26, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I actually thought 
it was, you know, it was just one of those things. But in hindsight, what you just said there, I was carrying this kind, I'm not saying the direct correlation, but I know that I was unhealth, in an unhealthy work environment that was causing unnecessary stress, anxiety, better that you name it. And I'm sure there was a direct impact to that me having cancer 30 years ago, almost to the day, actually. Mm -hmm. it was, I started my treatment about now, 30 years ago, 1993, and I'm still here, thank God. But, you know, but the, the direct correlation, and we've got to be super aware of this. And I think we all have an accountability responsibility for each other, top, bottom, you know, left and right, and however we kind of are in the, in the organizational structure, because it's real, and I think you're, you see it a lot. I do, and actually, in terms of that correlation, if I can go a little bit deeper, because I think it would be really um, valuable Many people are not aware of this. Um, there's an area called epigenetics. Um, scientific, there's plenty of research, so you can go um, have a look online. And what happens is when we are carrying exactly the, the chemicals from the experience of what you had in New York, that toxicity, you were carrying that in the body. Now, if you imagine all of us have the genetic predisposition, some of us do, some of us don't, but let's say we have the genetic predisposition to potentially um, carry certain diseases. And then I want you to think of it as like a light switch. Our state of mind, our state of well-being, alignment, balance, our energy, our thoughts basically directly correlate to whether we upregulate or deregulate those conditions. So the genetic potentiality was there for you. And, and thank goodness we're, we're here today and having this conversation. Um, but the potentiality was there. Now, because you were in this depleted state, mm. it, it's like, think of a light switch. It's like switching that on. You switch it on and you activate it. Now, I'm not going to go into the, the whole science of it. And I invite our listeners to please go in and have a look at this so you can learn more about it. It's really a fascinating area of research. But the, the key takeaway is that your thoughts and your experience and your energy and your state of being has the ability to upregulate or downregulate these conditions. Now, obviously, there are many other factors. Okay, so my area is psychology. I'm not a, a doctor. However, I am aware that, and I see it in my clients, mm -hmm. where we are able to take a more mindful path and a compassionate path and if we start to do the work together and, and do therapy, I work with my clients online, worldwide, um, over Zoom. And so, so their location yeah. is an issue. As soon as we can start the work and uh, rebalance, they are turning off potentialities of, of certain conditions. And yeah. I know there'll be many people who hear this and are going to think back to, to moments in their life and times when they've fallen ill and may actually start to consider wow, I stayed there and I tolerated that treatment. I swallowed it and I swallowed it and internalised yeah. it and I got really, really sick. If I had made a different decision and walked away from that environment, would my health outcomes have been different? And the answer is potentially yes, absolutely, which is why what you're doing, this area of compassion and compassionate leadership, in my opinion, is the most important uh, subject that we should be discussing in leadership today. No, oh, thank you. Well, I, I'm only doing it as a result of me not being there. So I, I had to look in the mirror and kind of reflect. And I was given this opportunity to do that. So, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm on a mission. You're on a mission. We're all on a mission. And I think it's not an age thing. It's a necessity thing that we have yeah. to focus on compassion. Leadership, by the way, when I talk about compassion leadership, just before we get to the two questions you want to ask me, is a leader... Anyone who shows the ability to act on empathy and sympathy, and that's what compassion is. Empathy and sympathy aren't things that we act on, you know, because I know that we, in empathy, we we want to feel the other person's pain and a negative consequence of that. But, you know, compassion is the action. Anyone who displays that to me is a compassion leader, no matter what role you have in the business. Compassion yeah. leadership is not entitlement. It's not a job title on your business card saying I'm an SVP, I'm a VP, therefore I'm a comp I need to be a compassionate leader. You could be have any role in the organization. If you're demonstrating kindness, empathy, and you're acting on, on, on sympathy, taking that action, to me, you are a compassionate leader. To me, you're a champion of compassion. That's what I want to make the world. <laughs> anyway, but we've got a lot to get through. And I want to, I want to, I'm dying for you to work on me a little bit. What are these questions do you want to ask? Okay, so, so, um, 
Those are good. So there, there's two things I'm super, super curious about. We'll, we'll see as, as your answers evolve if my, my question changes. The first one I want to know is, you know, and I've wanted to know this for years. So having someone who has, has taken, traversed this path and, and then you turned around and had a huge awakening um, in your own journey, which um, we can talk about. As you, you were very successful. You came in as a, you know, enthusiastic about the role. You were just clearly, and you were a natural born leader. You have the, the traits. Now, as you were given these opportunities to rise, I've always wanted to ask someone this. Was there a moment where you started perhaps sliding into, because I'm sure you had leaders above you behaving this way or your peer group and it becomes very competitive. What I'd love to, you to take your mind back to that moment where you started to encroach on your own values and exhibit behaviours that you just know that's not okay but you do it and somehow self-justify because it's about the numbers and it's, it's for the company. There's this crossover moment. And I'm, I've always been curious, do people realise they're crossing over? And when one has really, part B of question one, when you really, really crossed over onto the dark side and fully embraced this sort of, um, not saying that you did this, but I know you're aware of these traits, so I'll, I'll let you tell, tell us about um, what your journey was like. Once you, once you know you're doing it, do you how and why do you keep doing it? And then when you fully embody that, not you, anyone who's doing this, how do they sleep at night? Because as employees, I've heard many, I've heard thousands of people ask me, how do they sleep at night? Yeah, well, that is an, an incredible question. And I have the exact moment. It's ingrained in my head. I know it. In fact, I was talking, oddly enough, I was talking about this last week, to about you know 80 registered super yacht captains on the thing I was doing. And I, it, this is part of my reflection I went through. And um, I was on a um, trip, a incentive trip, you know, in the four seasons somewhere in, in the beautiful part of the world. And the company had acquired us. And we went from an incredibly people-centric, heart-led work culture and we were bought by an American software giant that started to dismantle everything in the space of about two or three weeks. Now, I know there's something about merging acquisition, about leveraging assets and doing that kind of stuff, but there's a way you do it without destroying hearts and minds of people, and particularly the hearts of people. So anyway, so I was running this, this, this global business unit, <clears throat> and we were off we went in a wonderful environment. And I remember to this point, the CEO coming up to me at one point and saying, hey, <clears throat> no, you're, you're going to be the next generation of our leadership. Whoa, am I? Well, that's great. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, we, you know, we, you know there's a, a, a succession plan in motion, and we see you as being right at the top of that. I'm like, wow, I connect. That's great. Hey, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. You know, because this is great. If I'm, 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 what a lovely surrounding. This is brilliant. If I can get this every single year, I am in. What do I need to do? Just tell me. Mm -hmm. Here's the answer. What I need to do is forget everything you've learned from the company that we just bought. Start being, create a, a, an environment of, of structured chaos in your own jurisdiction. Start putting fear into, this is a summary of what the, the conversation went. Mm -hmm. Start leading with fear and don't have and have a, a zero, to, zero tolerance for poor performance. Just get rid of your, your lowest performers every single year. And start to have this, display the same traits that we do on a, a, an SLT around, around this, and then you'll get to the top. And I spent the last so many years operating completely differently. So here I was being a people centered. And here's, a, here's where I, here was my crossover, actually. Oddly enough, I went from this empathetic, caring, loving manager of people that may be unhealthy because I was burdening everyone's stress and anxieties onto me. I wasn't care, taking care of myself, but I was an empathetic manager of people. And at this moment, when the question was asked of me, hey, to get to the top, are you prepared to do this? And I went, shit, yeah, I'll do it. 
if I can get to the top of this business, of this public mm. business, I will do what you want me to do, and I will throw away all my historical values to do it. Oh, um, I feel that. <laughs> I, I was like, I, I, I didn't know it at the time <clears throat> because self-interest took over. It was a financially driven, egotistical, narcissistic, probably in, 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 with your world, decision that I made to throw, I put self-interest above mm. self-compassion almost, and just threw it away. And that, that I remember that was in 2014 probably, and I carried that forward, no, that was in 2012, sorry, I carried that forward till about 2019. Because even when I left that company, I just took that, that whole structure with me. Yeah. And I, you know, for those people who knew me before that point when I was an empathetic leader, and had to deal with me being an autocratic arsehole as a boss, I apologize to them. You know, it was something that I really regret. But actually what I what I feel very grateful for is me being able to learn from that. And actually that was the moment, one of the moments that got me on the path of doing what I'm doing today. That kind of um, display of here's what we want you to be and how we want you to act goes on today. And it's, and it's, it's, a, it's an epidemic. In leadership that has to because mm -hmm. all we're doing we're not solving it we're just creating more and more people like that who just fall in the trap of self-interest over self-compassion or even just being a heart-led leader so that's why i'm on this journey but i absolutely remember that point and i started mm -hmm. to display it i became this autocratic people you know performance driven numbers driven you know, my my forecast calls were terribly fearful. You know, you, you walked to my forecast, and I, I engineered that. Mm. I engineered that I want you to be worried about how it's going to run. You know, you come in shit scared of the questions I'm going to ask you. Your numbers better be accurate. Your numbers better be bigger than you think they are. Mm. Because my forecast call that I went on to was just the same. Mm. I actually I stopped going to those forecast calls at, at, at some point. You know, when I started to realize this business was not for me, I I kind of stopped going to them because I, I, it's like this is just crazy. But I I didn't I would I wasn't able to unlock that from my own psyche because I fell into that trap. Wow, that was so vulnerable. Thank you for sharing that. And I will yeah. say, well, for me and probably for a lot of people listening, it is it's, it's the first evidence that sort of gives me some hope that others could also wake up to to this journey that they've been on perhaps they're still on it and they hear this and you know i'd love for that part of if that's you for that part of you that has has taken this road to to really go and have a look in the mirror and listen to what nigel is sharing here because nigel has has come to the other side of it and nigel you're not off the hook yet so you're being vulnerable so i'm going to take you right. Part, part of my part of my help and support I give to people is to be this vulnerable, you know. And I, I went, appreciate it so much. Yeah, and you, and you and you when we talked earlier, I talked about the ten traits of compassionate leadership. One of which is is trust, you know. Which you know, I, I can't trust other people, so I can, so I can trust myself. But then the second thing is honesty, and honesty isn't about the words that I get you to believe I'm saying, because actors can do that, right? Honesty is consistency of thoughts and action. So I've got to trust myself, and that's a direct correlation back to trust. So if I can't be vulnerable and just be openly admitting to a forum like this or to anyone I talk to, then mm -hmm. we're not going to make any change. And well, I can't, you, sorry, go on. No, you carry on. You can. I was going to say, not only are you vulnerable, what you have done, which is part of the healing journey, actually, both for the perpetrator and, and those who have been victims, even if they weren't, um, a victim of, of the characteristics that you have personally um, articulated um, is you went and started apologising um, to people who you believed you had wronged. And that is really, really, it's truly owning it and that's also healing uh, within yourself to know and to really look in the mirror and say, this was wrong and I have caused damage and I'm accountable for it. I'm going to start making amends for this. And I mean, not just in the work that you're doing today, but you personally reached out to people, didn't you, to, to yeah. extend apologies? Yeah, uh, I, I reached out to myself first. 
that's the first the first person I had to forgive was Martel. Mm. And you know, that otherwise I it was just I wouldn't be authentic. And I think, you know, you know, people make this different people have this kind of mindset that when I'm at work, I have I'm, a, I'm this persona. Whatever my job is, I'm, I'm this persona. When I'm at home, I'm this other persona. But actually, we don't have personas, but only one thing, and that's a human being. So, and it's very, and I think this is the trap that corporate society has got itself caught up in, in having, you know, forcing us to take, play, act, play and act out different roles, depending on the hat that we're wearing at the time, versus saying, actually, we understand we're all the same people. We're all human beings. We're all made of love and compassion. That's how we are. And by the way, in, in work I did, trying to get leaders to say, talk about love and compassion is a really difficult thing because they're just scared of doing it. <laughs> they're embarrassed. Which, and I went through the whole same thing, right? So, so anyway, I understand how difficult it is, but we're going to have a conversation about it because that's who we really are. So I think that is, um, that's one of the things that I, I, I found really difficult from when I started looking at, you know, not who are you as a human being, number one, and can you make sure you carry that trait as a human being into your life no matter what role you are playing so i have to be authentic i have to be true to myself then when i got to that point then i could say to everyone else okay I, I, you know i messed up i'm sorry about it i fucked up you know i'm swearing <laughs> it doesn't really matter right because this is we are who we are who we are yeah and i'm sorry for that but oddly enough a lot of those people kind of saw me go through this transition and stayed with me so they kind of knew they knew probably this was just a this is going to be a blip in my timeline <laughs> so I'm, I'm extremely grateful for that and th those people that only witnessed my my bad era didn't stay with me and why would they mm. they didn't learn anything they didn't see me who I genuinely was and I think that's indeed is what we have to be really conscious of. And and having come around, you know, and I want to I have one more. Um, going to go a little bit deeper on on a, a, a way, dark, way. dark face. But um, how before I ask that, how do you feel? You know, earlier in our dialogue, we were talking about the health consequences. So there were individuals in your journey who didn't know the, the empathetic and compassionate. And when I say empathy, I'm talking about the positive side of empathy because I know in your work, you talk a lot about the, the dark side of, of that as well. It's where there's compassionate action. Um, but there were individuals who didn't experience compassionate action, Nigel, in your journey, you just mentioned them. And hearing what that could have done to their their physical well-being as you hear that now i'm sorry for the question but it would be how do you how does that make you feel when you when you realize the impact and these are people you may never see again yeah and i saw it and i and i, I ignored it you know i knew that by the way it wasn't like i was so i think my tension when I started to realize that this wasn't who I really was, I became, I started to show empathetic and compassionate snippets throughout the course of the day to those people that hadn't seen me act like this before. But mm -hmm. for those that hadn't seen it before, I knew, and you know what's really strange? I knew that I'd make their evening and the weekend feel really bad. I kind of wanted to do that. Well, I didn't want to do it, I wasn't personally doing it. But I had this kind of thing that said, right, you know, going back to my early career, working 18 hours a day, I have this long work, hour work ethic. That's me. And I want everyone to be like me. And if you're not working the weekends, you're not working the hours, why not? I'm going to call you at 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, and I want you to pick up the phone, and we're going to talk for a long time. I didn't need to do that. I just didn't need to do it, but I did it. Why? Because I think I thought I'd needed to do this because I was told this would get me to the top of the tree. I started to do that. And I knew fine well people say, oh, no, I'm not, I'm, no, I can't call you. I want to got dinner with my family or we're going out. I said, no, no, cancel that. And I had the audacity to say, cancel it, cancel this stuff. It was really pathetic. So, and actually that's where I realized how pathetic I, I was I was becoming because I started to display traits. I didn't believe, you know, I knew I didn't believe in doing this. 
as I'm sitting having to do with my own family, I'm telling people, don't do that. That is crazy. It's madness. Why? Because I was getting pressure from above, which you were talking about earlier. This mm. was the toxic, the toxic architecture of the business that had been put around in place. And I don't know why it happens, but sales seems to be glued to this kind of organizational architecture. It's absolutely crazy. So, yeah, so it, it made me feel, in, in hindsight, I, I felt really bad about it. In the moment, I kind of knew it wasn't right, but I felt quite powerful in doing it. I was displaying a negative power because I thought it was the right thing to do at the time, and I did, that's why I did it. But in hindsight, it was shockingly bad. I should never have done that. And no leader, no manager should do that. Just because we've got our own, our own values and expectations, how we operate, which is probably a false positive anyway, but we are going to do, we're going to ask other people to display it because I want, it fell downhill, right? I had to be like the person above me. I wanted people who were working for me to be like me. So that's how that kind of long, dark shadow, mm. of, you know, that's how it affects. And everyone gets involved in it. And it's just horrendous how that, that web of that shadow can affect so many people that are not a part of my KPI, but not mm. part of my target. It's crazy. But yeah, I felt I felt at the moment I felt falsely good about it, a bit of power behind it. But in hindsight, I feel really bad. Well, I just want to say what a, a gift for everyone to be able to hear the inner thoughts of someone who has gone to the dark side and is has come back around and is able to reflect on that. So it is back in the day when witnessing it. It would have been a dream come true because we i used to sit there and ponder what is going through to that person's mind like how can you be this way so to have you be so vulnerable publicly in this in this fashion is a real gift and i'm really appreciative so i'm gonna I'm going to just push it a little bit no. further. <laughs> if you're if with your permission yeah you got, it. You, you got my permission <laughs> thank you when was the moment and what precipitated that moment where you looked in the mirror and knew enough, like not just a little, like I'm going to adjust enough. This is just plain wrong. I'm being evil now at this point. I'm destroying people's well-beings, their family, um, not to mention how productive is someone going to be working in this environment of total fear? It's completely cut off creativity, zero innovation possible when you're in this, when the employee's in this fearful contracted state. And you were the root cause for many of these individuals. Mm. I feel mean saying that, but I think it's really important that, you know, we continue like in this place of honesty. When was the moment where those things that I said, I even feel harsh saying it, where you knew this is what I'm doing enough yeah could i invite you to just go back to that moment? yeah and, and that's a great question and you know going back to my trust and honesty i'm open to answering any questions that you want because that's how how transformation of individuals can, can really happen and we can only start transformation of, of this toxic environment by by being honest and open about it so i think for me in hindsight the journey took a while to get there and i think now, I was on a spiritual path as well. So I think that was really beginning to help me. And, and that's a whole different conversation about how I spent 45 years ignoring uh, ignoring that or even longer. But I was on this journey to of spiritual awakening. And, you know, I was about you know, six years ago, I would never admit admitted that <laughs> in, a, in a million years. But I'm not afraid of admitting it today uh, because it plays a really important uh, part of my, of my change. And it's something I'm, I'm really... I do every single day. So I think that's on that path anyway. So there might have been some in, you know, spiritual intervention that's saying, Naj, you better start changing this. You know, I think what having is, Naj, I want to teach you a lesson. <laughs> and you're going to learn this lesson, but I'm going to take you out of it. So I think there's something going on underneath that was saying, right, okay, we're going to get you out of this. But when it manifested consciously to me was when um, I was coming out of a another work situation where we'd had a huge accelerated growth. You know, we were, you know, one of the fastest growing IT service company in the UK and all that kind of stuff. But we didn't really have a 
focused on the corporate culture of that organization. So things were going wrong for me in, you know, as an individual. And I kind of was given this opportunity to work on a different company just before the pandemic. And I think this was the moment, and I remember this moment. So anyone who was listening, who was in this meeting when I said this, will remember it. And I remember looking at people's faces like, this guy's nuts. I said, <laughs> I said, my desire for this new company, you know, this company today, I'm going to leave from my spiritual place. Because I, I, from my, my first introduction to my new team in the UK, I'm going to leave from a spiritual place. And that's the kind of leader I want to be. And I'm like, wow, this guy's crazy. It ain't going to happen here. <laughs> it's never going to work here. You know, so I just forget it. So I said, right, okay. Admitted what I'm going to do. I'm open with it. So that, and I was, thinking, I was thinking, I was spending hours and days thinking, should I say it? Should I say it? Should I say it? If I don't say it, I can't really do it. So I've got to be, I've got to throw it out there and try and, and, and do that. So I said, that's what I'm going to do. Right. Okay. Let's go on this journey together. And about seven or eight months later, the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And, oh, we're going to have to do something a bit differently because we were going to have to, you know, we were scaling up, not scaling down. We were hiring, not firing. We were doing all the things that were, were in a growth mode. So I knew, you know, I knew that we're gonna. I'm gonna have to hire lots of people, never meet them for a couple of years. We're gonna have to bring on new, different types of customers and never meet them either. Um, you know, when we did meet some big customers, we celebrated quite well. <laughs> After we had some pretty big deals with them in London, but I said, right, Nigel, okay, what are you gonna do here? Because you can't run this organization with such dramatic emotional distress in the hearts in the hearts of people the same way you have done you will fail and you'll probably end up dying you'll become so unhealthy that you'll become so stressed and so anxious it will you'll do no good you'll something is going to go wrong or worse someone else is going to do something wrong someone else is going to end up taking their own life potentially this is this is what i felt was was wrong so you know because i'm on the spiritual path i had to lead differently and i had to put the emotional well-being of my team way ahead of everything else you know i had to make sure we were doing that starting thinking and thinking through okay this is covid people are dying unexpectedly without any the the, the cause is is a disease that can take you in days. What's our what's our um, grievance policy like? Mm. Is, it, is it you know? I started looking at things like is the architecture of our operating model fit for a compassionate environment? And it wasn't. It was completely broken. It it was it was almost kind of fit for purpose pre pandemic, but it still wasn't great. We were mm. still working putting people first in that operating model. But it was completely broken when we went into the world of, of the pandemic. So we did a lot of things, you know, I had to do things I'd never done before, which was, you know, taking care of, of making sure people are okay. Everyone did it, but I took it to heart. And I actually I, I had I looked in the mirror and said, right, Nigel, what kind of leader do you want to be remembered for in this moment? Because this is going to be your legacy, potentially. People, you know, people coming out of this problem will remember you greatly or badly for how you act today. And, you know, coming out of the pandemic, we've been hit by so many other different problems. I mean, thank God I took that kind of position with myself and thank God I'm in a, doing what I do today. So is that, is that moment, I think, to ask your question, I'm a bit long-winded. I, I, I was coming out of another toxic work culture. I was spent a lot of time looking in the mirror saying, Nigel, okay, what kind of company do you want to go and work for next? It has to be different. It has to be culture. It has to be people-centered. And thankfully it was. What kind of person do you want to be remembered for? And can you sleep at night, as you were talking about earlier, can I be honest and trusting in myself and be generous and be kind and, and you know, be tolerant of myself and others in this moment? Because that's what I'm going to, that's going to define me. And thank you know, I, I really appreciate going, you know, working for that company and giving that opportunity for me to change my leadership style. It was forced mm -hmm. upon me to do it. And I and I had to do it. And a lot of people who 
who reacted to the situation of the pandemic, I think I was grateful enough to be able to manage or reflect on the situation of the people before the pandemic. So that's kind of, that was my moment. I think it was my defining moment. I'm quite, and I never, I never talked about that before. So you, again, you've done, you've done it again. You, you've been yeah. asking me to explain. I think that was, that was the moment. It was people before the pandemic versus the pandemic for the people. Yeah. But me, start with me. Nigel, who do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be? How do you want to be remembered? Just in case, you know, it could have happened to me, right? I could have gone, you know, I always remember, I listened to a podcast the other day talking about the egg timer. You know, you can see the, the seeds or the sand going from the top to the bottom. Just cover the top so you've got no idea how much time you've got left. Mm. You, can see, you can see the bottom. But you've got no how much idea how you're going to live in the top. Now, whoa. Wow, that is a great anecdote. That is a great metaphor for life, right? You just got no idea. So I think as leaders, we have we should put that into our, into our psyche and think, who do you want? To, how do you want to be remembered? And not you know, I'm, I know I'm wrapping on a bit. I did this exercise with the super yacht captains last week, and mm. I gave them a pre exercise. And the pre exercise was this before they turned up to the workshop, and I did it myself. And I'll, I'll send it out to anyone who wants to do it. The exercise was that you are going to the funeral of one of your employees. You're going to a funeral to celebrate the life of an employee that used to work for you. And the only people in the congregation is the family and your fellow work colleagues of this person. Let's call it person Alice. I don't remember Alice. So you have to reflect on, and you know, during after the congregation, after the service, the family comes to talk to you. You're, you were the captain or you were the leader, you were the manager of Alice. Reflect on how you acted to Alice or the, any, any person. And what did you do to help Alice through her emotional traumas that she was having? How do you want to be remembered? I kind of, it was things like that that I did. And, you know, I had to kind of think, how do I want to be remembered? How, what kind of person do I want to be remembered? I certainly didn't want to be remembered like the people I used to work for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so could i start a path of my own trajectory could i create nigel's pathway not my previous experiences pathway could i learn how to be the leader that i wanted to be versus who was telling me how to be and that's why you know, i ended up being you know this loving caring healthy compassionate leader and that's what i wanted to do and that was that was my journey it was, it was You've kind of you you put it in you've made it so succinct through you know for the forty eight minutes it's brilliant that that's that's how I wanted to be but yeah anyway, I think going back to your, your question there was a moment where I had to be courageous with myself and it was in that sentence when I said to my teams I'm going to lead spiritually that was my brave moment that for mm -hmm. me was a crossover from from the autocratic idiot into a journey to becoming a compassionate leader. Mm, beautiful. And I'll tell you, there are many of us who, when I exited, you know, I worked with some really top consulting companies and I was in the, in the tail end of that journey, I'll, I'll tell you, I was secretly spiritual. And even when I came out of it um, and working with clients one-to-one, -one, I would sort of listen out for cues that it was okay to go there. But now it's like fully embracing it and having individuals really look in the mirror and ask themselves both those who've experienced this kind of environment and those perpetrating it look in the mirror am i being the highest version of myself mm. and if the answer is no that's where your journey begins are you yeah. being the highest version of yourself looking back on each day did you show up as the best most beautiful integrity-based version of you today or did you not and if you are looking in the mirror and feeling some guilt or grappling or feeling uncomfortable I'd invite you to really really sit down and have a think about what you want to do differently because you've heard through this conversation the impact that has on you those who are working in your environment your family your health their health there's a long tail and every moment and every day that you wake up, you have the opportunity to do things differently.
So then you come home and you ask yourself, was I the highest version of myself today? Yeah. It's, it's, if, you can't, if you can't say yes, something's it's the most, It's the most simplest, beautiful exercise that anyone can do. And I think one other thing that I do, I, I go last, for, last thought, first thought, which is the last thought at night should detaching yourself from everything that's happened throughout the course of the day. It's not, you know, don't take, don't sleep with accountability and responsibility for stuff that was bad throughout the course of the day because you won't get a good night's sleep. So, and your first thought should be, I'm going to do the, I'm going to do that today. I'm going to, you know, today I'm going to be the best version of myself so I can detach and, and attach, detach the, all, everything from the day, sleep well, and attach myself to, to greatness for the following day. And I kind of did that, you know, I don't do it every, every day, but it's something I try and help people think through particularly sales managers who are in this layer of the sandwich and it's it's not good, you know, and they've got to find a way out of it. You know, because I've, it's going back into the whole thing around self-leadership or leadership in general or, or, or management of people in general. We've got to, we're, we're at a correction, I think. We have, a, globally, we have an opportunity where we can, redesign our businesses without changing too much of the operational framework. That's my dog barking. So and it's got to start with people. And I know that you do, you do a lot of work trying to remove toxicity from people and organization. But what can, what do you think we can do better? Where, I know we, we all say it starts with individual, but how do we get to that point where the individual can start to to learn better from us or learn how to change? How do you help? So um, first of all, I see, you know, I mentioned that I see my other clients both work in companies and I see clients one-to-one. -one. And um, I'm going to share a metaphor, actually, because it'll apply to, to both environments, if that's okay. And so whether, whether it's a company or an individual, but especially for individuals, if you... I want you to imagine, you can close your eyes if it's more comfortable, you don't have to. But if you just imagine when you were born, you came into the world with this beautiful, shining diamond inside you. Now, each and every moment of anger, sadness, fear, hurt, guilt, shame, programming from teachers, parents, employers, everyone around you over the years, each time it's not aligned with the truth of who you are, and we're all beautiful and unique and perfect in your own individual way, perfectly imperfect things. It's like putting a blanket over that diamond each and every time. So people are walking around in this depleted state with all these blankets. So um, first of all, in the work that I'm doing with my clients, um, just using this metaphor, it's about even if we've had held on to those blankets for 40 years, 50 years, however long they've been there, it takes a few seconds to lift them and I do a lot of somatic work where we actually isolate where where is this energy or all these energies where have they landed in the body where are they and we're able to remove those transmute that energy out of the individual so even if you've felt that this is you know I've done this for 20 years I'm depleted whether you're the leader the perpetrator or you've received this abuse so I don't like the word victim but you've experienced this toxicity within you as an individual, we can absolutely re quite rapidly remove those blankets, bring you bring that diamond back to full shine. And when you as an individual are showing up as this best version of you, either the leader or the person individual, but doing that in a, in a spiritual way, for me, it's about boundaries. Anything that encroaches or feels like it's putting a blanket over your diamond, boundaries boundaries are sacred and this is something i'm really educating people on if it's not okay we also need individuals in the workplace to to set these boundaries it's sacred keep that diamond shining we remove those blankets from your diamond and if it's if it's an encroachment you do not accept it so boundaries are sacred i also believe as you said that the processes, it's not the processes, it's these behaviours. And we saw it 
we either received it, perpetrated it, or witnessed it. So there's three people, there's sort of three parties involved. And we used to turn a blind eye. But it's not sacred, it's not spiritual, and it's not aligned in any way to just witness it and do nothing. And this is a like a blanket on their diamond for sort of saying, okay, now you went in in this pandemic environment and actually looked at the policies and said this isn't good enough actually change things so it's not about oh we need to change the sales system no those processes are fine mm. sacred boundaries respecting what's okay and what's not okay so if you have a collective of people not willing to tolerate that then we start to move into the area of what is okay what is okay is compassionate leadership emotional intelligence starting to while narcissists might be very attracted to these roles, identifying the individuals who are able to openly talk about topics of compassion and the heart and understand that we're also actually emitting from the heart, not just from the brain. There are energies that we put out there and that facilitates innovation, creativity. Mm. <laughs> There are actual statistics. There are brilliant Gallup um, papers. I was reading some this morning with research and statistics about um, it actually, it's been shown to result in 21% greater productivity. So if you have compassionate leaders, um, I don't, it was a Gallup study. I don't know the name of it. Yeah, but it was. Yeah. 21% greater profitability. So the systems are fine, but when we start to change these behaviours and we start bringing compassionate leadership into the environment and you have individuals honouring their boundaries and their diamond, leaders who care and are actually taking compassionate action and fostering this environment, creativity spikes, innovation spikes, 21% increase in productivity. So the sales figures actually increase and it's real and that is where so i'm so thrilled that you are so openly discussing spirituality and um, these and also it's an emotional intelligence conversation as well when you bring these two elements into it this is about the people and having a new type of person in these leadership roles and also um individuals honoring themselves which is in my opinion that for me is spiritual. Mm. Bring this into the workplace. It's a new. It's a new day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I, you know, when I talk to people, that are saying, you know, I can, how can how can you make me a, a, a compassionate leader? Well, I can't make you. Only you can make you. But but here, here are the things that you can do to make you. Um, here are the ten traits of compassionate leadership. How I think they are, and actually, the, those traits have got nothing to do with the business. They're all to do with the person. And who and how they interact with other people, which is really, really powerful. But I also say it's one thing you becoming a compassionate leader, but the whole business has to become compassionate, you know, because compassion is absolutely everywhere. And they go, well, well, what do you mean by that? So, well, listen, compassion needs to be in your, in your SLAs, it has to be in your customer contract, it has to be in your supply chain, it has to be. In your customer engagement, it has to be in your marketing. It has to be in your advertising. It has to be. It has to be in your manufacturing processes. Your engineering it has to be absolutely everywhere. And they go, "Yeah, you're right." So I say, you know, you need a compassionate operating model. And you know, and I, and I use this stat that you're talking about because if you put compassion everywhere, without changing very much, you know, you, you, you're elevating your brand to stand behind the fact that you are becoming a compassionate business. And by the way, you'll get a whole bunch more customers by doing that. You'll get yes. a whole bunch more <laughs> shareholders by doing that. <laughs> Just as a natural byproduct, you, you'll, you'll make more money. Yeah. You know, if that, and you'll get, you know, your shareholder value will increase by doing that. And mm -hmm. another byproduct is people will stay with you. So your employee retention will be, will be fixed. You know, so all of these issues around putting compassion at the heart of your business. And actually, we have a framework called Promise, and you put, you know, compassion business at the center of it, and you have all these areas. And you mentioned something very, very interesting, which is innovation and critical thinking just unlocks itself when you've got compassion. And it goes back to your very first thought when you were talking about creativity. You know, people come into the sales, sales function because they're creative and they want to help people because they've got the kind of this inner – being that makes them a salesperson. And I think when you put compassion at the center of your business, 
you know, you'll get a lot, a lot more of that. So you might find that salespeople want to come, great salespeople want to come and work with you to become even better salespeople. That's another great benefit all around. And that horrible weekly sales forecast call will just be a different, <laughs> will be a different, a different <laughs> thing altogether. Then you've got employees with, their, I, I say they're in full shine. Their diamond is shining. The leader's diamond is shining. The numbers are shining. The customers are happy. And guess what? The customers want to engage with you over the competitors because they have a really positive and enjoyable engagement in all their interactions with you. So when it's imbued in the culture and and it's really, if you're thinking, oh, yeah, but how do you bring this to life? Literally picture that diamond inside you. Is this decision I'm about to make or what this person is doing to me? Is that putting a blanket over my diamond or is it enhancing my shine? If you want to use a metaphor, it's a just use that if you remember nothing else. And yeah. that will help you decide in each and every moment, is this next moment what, what I'm deciding or what's being done to me or what you're witnessing? Is it going to enhance the shine? Is it going to diminish it? And when this becomes part of the culture, and as you said, even in the policies, in the leave, in the absence policies, in um, maternity leave, paternity leave, really looking at the whole thing through this lens, is this going to enhance this shine for these employees? And I, you know, I, I use that metaphor just because it's sim it's a simple visual, but actually it makes decision making so much easier and it actually enables you to change. So when what your point is is so important, we can we can talk, we can have leaders saying, yes, I'm very interested in, in um, compassionate leadership. However, please understand and hear this. It needs to really um, become the culture of everyone involved in, in the organization, whether they're back office, front office, customer facing, anywhere. Uh, Throughout, if, if when that becomes the culture, people want to be there. People want to do business with you. And at the end of the day, um, your sales figures are going to rise and you become an attractive employee. So there are thousands and thousands of open roles right now. People will want to come and work with you. Yeah. Because I think, you know, I've always believed that compassion is a, is a strategic transformation for the organisation. And you know, I hate the word transformation. It, it is, you know, it, I think it's over overused. But I think the word transformation was designed for putting compassion in front of it, because that's what you know, digital transformation. Oh, I can't start. Yeah, 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 yeah. But changing, you know, the intent, the soul of, a, of an organization, that's mm -hmm. true transformation. So I think that's where, where you, and you and I have been talking about, you know, coming together to, to help organizations fix functions like sales and how we can do it in this way so i think the next podcast will we'll get into the meat a bit about how we can help organizations change but for me i think you know if i'm a, if I'm a leader thinking listening to us right now i'm a chief people officer i'm a chief sales officer operate you know whatever i am i'm a business owner i'm thinking okay yeah i get i get the i've got to change individually yeah i get the benefits my life will be better i'll have emotional wealth i'll have health i'll have you know, you know, that long, dark shadow will begin to disappear and there'll be brightness. Okay, great. I get that. But now what I'm hearing is I've got to change my infrastructure. I've got to change my architecture because I've got, you know, how I how I show up into my business has got to be reflected in the ability for everyone else to, to do it. And I think that that's where we, we're going to start to help people think through how they can change that. And I think that for me is my biggest lesson that I learned was don't just change yourself, change your environment. Absolutely. To allow, for, to allow what you want to be, to be authentic and to and it, and it, for it, it to thrive, or as you beautifully put it, allow my diamond to shine. And with authentically shine, you know, it, it's a, that's really quite important. So, you know, it's, and it prevents this toxic work cultures that we accept. Why do we accept it? Why did why do we come up and just accept? Oh, I'm going to work. I mean, how many people dread going to work? I mean, it's just like you know, you know, you read the same polls. I thought I had a perfect ending to the to the to our session there, but I, I'm, going to, I'm going to open up a whole a whole new can of worms here. You know, 
you know, when we look at the Gallup poll, you're talking about, you know, one in five people are feeling sadness or anger every single day. One in five. So if I employ a thousand people, 200 of them are sad or angry every single day. This is not now and again. It's not, oh, my God, I'm my, my, my manager's just pissed me off and I feel angry. No, this is consistent. Mm -hmm. This is a huge, you know, when I was growing up as a, as a wee lad doing my, in, my, my, in my career, you know, oh, we looked at stress and anxiety as a, as a data point if we looked at, at it at all. Oh, yeah, there's, there's HR things come out, stress and anxiety. We just pay yeah, it was always it. an HR statistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, thanks for the report, guys. That's really good. We're going to do all about it, though, but thanks for the report. But now, when we, you know, you talk about getting deeper, we've now peeled away the onion layer a bit, and now we're talking about sadness and anger. And I know that soon we'll be talking about the rates of suicide in companies, right? That will become a statistic, and that will be a really sad point. It's already happening. It's happening, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I volunteer for a charity that does this, and, you know, I, I hear it every week. Mm. And, you know, I, I'm blessed to be able to do that. And I think it's a wonderful thing for me to be able to be on the other, on the other end of the phone and people sharing their, their troubles and their anxieties. It's a real blessing for me to be able to do that. But you know that's where that's where folks that's where we're heading. We are heading towards a premises of this situation where ten years ago we we're measuring stress and anxiety, and now we're going to measure suicide or end of life as we call it. That's where we're at. We've got we've got to put a stake in the ground and stop. We've got to reflect and we're going to do something about it now before it's too late. Do you agree? Absolutely, absolutely, completely. And in fact, to, to those who are in that trajectory now with the anger, sadness, fear, hurt, guilt, shame, you know who you are and I know that you're carrying that. And the simple request to you is to please reach out for help because there are absolutely therapeutic journeys that we can take you on. And it's not something where you're sitting for years and years and years, but we can actually help you to relieve your body of, of these tensions, these emotions, and you can feel peace, you can restore balance, you can restore your self-worth and actually feel good about um, your career and, and working again. That's absolutely possible. You know, I've worked with hundreds of people, seen them have this turnaround, but every single one at the beginning thing is just not, they're just so miserable. They don't even see that it's possible, but it is. So please, please, please reach out for help. And I think that is a perfect ending to our first podcast on the, on this on this subject. I think there's so much more. I think our aim today, even though we just we just jumped on and we just had a chat for an hour, an hour and ten minutes, but I think that, you know self reflection for me is what you've helped me do over the last two or three phone calls that we've had together. And I think you know you and I are now talking about evolving this whole programmatic approach to, for people to to get help which they really need and the help you know is, is both individually and through the organization so i think you know how do they you know for those people who could you shared an exercise with me last week about the throat and i thought that was quite a, a powerful thing to do so i know you've got great tools and techniques and skills and advice and you can take people from point a of point A of pain and suffering into point B, which is just a beautiful, a beautiful, oh, B for beautiful, into, into a beautiful space. So, and C for compassionate space, A, B, C, there you go. So anxiety, beauty, oh, compassion, A, B, C, there you go. Who would have thought it? Oh, I should be a brand expert. And, but how do they get a hold of you? Great question. And all you need to do is just head on over to www.highwaytoheal.com and highway to heal .com. yes wow not highway to help but highway to heal right that... highway to heal <laughs> nice and sticky so you should be able to remember it um my husband said i'm just gonna pop out to the car and listen to acdc now oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but highway to .com and um you know i'll get you get you started you'll be able to download a beautiful gift which is a boundary setting journal <laughs> <laughs> which oh, is wow. the first step in in this um path forward for you so please head on over there avail yourself of of that journal and then we will be able to get in touch with one another 
Well, listen, Rio, I, it's been an absolute pleasure. I, I, I know we've got a lot more to talk about in other sessions, but you know, it's been great. I really am grateful for your time, and thank you so much for sharing some great advice to everyone who's listening. And definitely go to highwaytoheal.com. It, it's, it's. I, I went there. It's great. So please, if you if you've got the time, do it or reach out to Vanessa on LinkedIn or any social channel that you can get a hold of. Rita, thank you and stay blessed. Thank you. Thank you for your vulnerability, Nigel, and for having me on your show. Deeply appreciate it. And I'm so excited about all the work we're going to do together. Great. Thank you. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.